Hi, I'm Rowan from Vantage Admissions. And in this video, we're going to work through a recent interview question asked for economics at Cambridge. This question is about elementary applications of calculus to the study of economics. And in particular, we will see a first principles derivation of a formula for the price elasticity of demand. These sorts of questions, which test our ability to apply ideas from A-level maths to an explicitly economics context, feature quite frequently. If you're interested in more interview questions or broader support with your interview preparation, do remember to subscribe and to visit our website. So this is a fairly standard question. It's been asked recently to Cambridge Econ graduates and we see these sorts of things repeatedly uh, in that we're going to need to apply some basic mathematics. So really just ideas to do with differentiation, including first principles differentiation to an explicitly economics context. So the price elasticity of demand, something with which you should already have some intuitive familiarity, we're going to subject it to a mathematical analysis. And for Cambridge economics, where it is at least at first quite a mathematical course, they do really like in at least part of the interview to test you on your math skills, whether that be in a pure maths context or, as in this question, by getting you to apply some maths to economics. So it would be very worthwhile for you to have a go at this question independently first. I'd recommend pause the video now and have a go. And if you've unpaused or you've decided to skip trying it yourself, let's now jump in. So we define the price elasticity of demand as the percentage change in the quantity demanded by consumers per percentage change in the price per unit. So it's a bit like a rate of change, the rate of change of quantity with respect to price, but we're dealing with the percentage changes rather than absolute changes. Now this makes a lot of sense. If, for example, the price of a luxury car increases by £10, that's a pretty inconsequential percentage change, and our mathematical analysis should judge it as such. It's not really a change that actually matters much, right? £10 on the price of something that might be £50,000, £100,000 doesn't matter much. On the other hand, if Walker's ready salted crisps go up by £10, because the price originally was so low, that's a massive consequential change in the price. And again, the mathematical analysis should treat it as such. So it clearly makes sense that we're talking about percentage changes rather than absolute changes if we want to quantify how important a change in a market or a price is. Um, but because that means it's not exactly a rate of change, a rate of changes for absolute quantities, it's not going to be exactly a derivative. And, and that's why we have this slightly funny looking expression in part two. So for part one, we want to interpret this quantity intuitively. So this is something that really you should be able to do uh, without too much thought. This should be a reasonably familiar idea if you're looking to apply for economics. So it's really a way of measuring, if you like, or quantifying the responsiveness of demand to price. So if I have a very high elasticity, that means that I only need a small change in price to induce a large change in quantity. So if the, if the supplier puts up the price a little bit, the demand will fall a lot. So that suggests that the consumers have a lot of freedom. If, if they're put off by an increased price, they're free to reduce their demand either by just foregoing the product or by going to a competitor. So it should be easy to give an example. So high elasticity, well, that's going to happen if it's an item that people don't really need. So they can just reduce their consumption of if they're not happy with the price or maybe they can move to an alternative product. So, for example, packets of crisps, we would expect to have a high uh, elasticity because crisps are generally a snack. They're not life or death. If you're really bothered by the price, you can just skip your snack or you can have a different snack instead. So packets of crisps would be a product where we would expect there to be a very high elasticity. And if there's a low elasticity, that suggests that the consumers don't really have the freedom to reduce their consumption or switch to a sort of competitor product, they're basically forced to just suck up the change in price and pay over what they would have liked to. So a good example of this would be something like a very niche economics textbook, say, because for a very niche economics textbook, it might be that, for example, the main market is undergraduate students and maybe the universities are putting this on their reading list as a mandatory book they need to have for the course. So they can't reduce their consumption. They can't 
to opt for a different competitor. They've got to have that specific book. Therefore, they're basically forced to pay whatever's demanded. So even if there's quite a big percentage change in the price, it's not going to impact the quantity much. They have no freedom. So these are some good examples. Now, in part two, we want to prove using first principles differentiation that we can write elasticity as a function of quantity and price in this way here. So this is a little bit like the idea of first principles differentiation where we get an expression for the rate of absolute change. But now we want the rate of percentage changes, if you like, with respect to percentage change. So what do we do with first principles differentiation? Let's first think carefully about what we do in the simple situation we know and love. Well, we'd first write down a change of one per change in the other. And then we take a limit that makes the change very small so that we get the notion of a kind of infinitesimal change. We should be able to do exactly the same thing here. So let's consider two points, P1, Q1, and P2, Q2, on the demand curve. So by the demand curve, of course, all I mean is the graph of quantity demanded by the consumers as a function of price. And if I consider two different points on that curve, so two different prices and the resultant quantity, I can think about this percentage change in one per percentage change in the other between these two points. And then if I want to get this as a kind of infinitesimal percentage change, you know, instantaneously what is the rate of percentage change, I just need to think about a limit where I squeeze these two points closely together. Now, actually, because we're saying that quantity is being considered here as a function of price, it's helpful to note that we can actually think of Q1 as being the quantity function evaluated at P1. And similarly, Q2, we can consider to be the quantity function evaluated at P2. So these things are not completely um, independent. Okay, so what is epsilon? Well, it's the percentage change in quantity. So that's going to be the change in quantity divided by the initial quantity. So I'm thinking here about the percentage change when I go from price one to price two. So the absolute change in quantity divided by the original quantity times 100. That's what a percentage change is. And then that is per percentage change in the price. So I do exactly the same thing, but with prices instead of quantities. Now we obviously get some nice simplification. I can cancel out the hundreds and I can use that division by a fraction is like multiplication by the reciprocal to simplify this into P1 over Q of P1 times QP2 minus QP1 over P2 minus P1. Now, here's where the first principle differentiation comes in. We have to follow that hint from the interviewer that we know we want to try and involve it. So we seek to consider, if you like, a limit when the two points, P1 and P2, are very close. In other words, it's like I want to let P2 be just a little bit more, say a little amount H, than P1 was and consider the limit when the distance goes to zero. Because I want a function for elasticity. I want to know what is the instantaneous rate of percentage change. So just like with first principles differentiation for a gradient, I look at this quantity for two points in general, and then I ask what happens when I make the two points really, really close together so that it's not actually a kind of infinitesimally small variation. So what does this then become if I now actually use the notion that I do want these things together? I've got a limit. Um, so I can actually leave the P1 and the QP1 out of the limit because they don't depend on H. But I am going to use that P2 is just P1 plus H. So P2 minus P1 by definition is H. We introduce that as the discrepancy. Now, what is this? This is nothing other than dq by dp, right? By definition of the first principle derivative, it's the change in y divided by the change in x as I squeeze the change in x to zero. So we've now obtained 
the result. And I can drop the subscript P because I'm now just talking about the price at the point I'm kind of infinitesimally inspecting. So I get P over Q, which is implicitly itself a function of P, times DQ by DP. So although nothing we did there was extremely complicated, you can see why many students would find that really rather challenging. Because it's so unusual from you know, a typical school perspective to use a very niche part of A-level maths, first principles differentiation, in an economics context. But we didn't have to do anything hugely creative. We just had to take the initiative to think about the limit that we're familiar with from maths and to take the initiative to start writing something down. Even just taking the step of actually writing down the percentage changes without being spoon fed that by the interviewer is a really helpful step, which will have gone a long way to impressing. So that's part two completed. I would consider this kind of book work to memorize for an econ interview because it features so much. Of course, you should be prepared to justify the steps, not just to rattle them off. Now, in part three, we consider a linear demand curve and we want to show that epsilon is unity halfway along the demand curve. So a quick comment here. Elasticity is actually going to be negative if you think about it because P and Q are positive. And this is going to be a negative derivative because if you think about it, clearly demand in general will fall with price. If I put the price up, that will disincentivize purchase. So really epsilon is negative, but economists, especially in introductory texts, will often ignore the minus. And so when this is minus five, they'll talk about an elasticity as five. They'll kind of ignore the minus and talk about the absolute value. So when we talk about unity here, what we really mean, strictly speaking, is minus one. Um, so that it may well be that they would explain this to you in the interview, or they might expect you to just realize, well, obviously it's the absolute value we care about because it's always negative anyway. So we say we can assume a linear demand curve. So that means that the quantity demanded is a linear function of price and it must be a, a negative gradient because we know, as we said, that we're expecting quantity demanded to fall as we increase the price. So for this demand curve, I can now just work this thing out. So in general, I get P over Q, P over A minus BP multiplied by dq by dp, which is just minus b. So, you know, this is trivial differentiation. We're not doing anything complicated, but taking the initiative to write down a curve, inferring from basic economic intuition that, well, it's going to have a negative gradient and just computing. Taking that initiative is what they're going to be looking for to see that you're not someone who just needs to be spoon fed or apply a method you've wrote learned, but you're actually prepared to explore, to try things, to take first steps without necessarily seeing a clear route right the way to the end. Initiative is so important in these interviews. So this is the general expression for the elasticity at a general price. We're talking about halfway along the demand curve. So the demand curve obviously begins at a price of zero. So when we have price at zero, what was the quantity? Well, it's going to be A. And obviously it ends at the point where quantity has fallen down to zero. We're not going to think about a negative quantity. So the end of the demand curve is going to be, well, when A minus BP is zero. So that means it's going to be when P is A divided by B. Um, and sorry, I should really write these the other way around because we're thinking about price as, as, the func as the variable and quantity as the output. Um, so, so that one should have been a price of zero and a quantity of A. And now we're talking about a price of A by B and a quantity of zero. So it's like these are the two ends of my curve, that point and that point. So the midpoint, which is where I want to inspect, well, that's going to have um, halfway between zero and A by B as the price. So it's going to be a price of A by 2B. <laughs> so, you know, nothing complicated. We're just finding the axis intercepts of a straight line. But so many students, even though this is straightforward, will freeze because it might look a bit unfamiliar. So we know we're looking for a price of A by 2B. I can simply plug that in there. So epsilon becomes the price which is a by 2b, divided by a minus bp. So a minus b times that is a by 2. 
and then that was all multiplied by minus b. So I've just plugged that special p-value in because I'm looking specifically at the midpoint. So I get a by 2b all over, well, that's just a by 2, times minus b. So that is a by 2b times 2 by a times minus b. Cancel, 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 which is minus 1 as required. And we'll call that unity because really we're always talking about the absolute value. So a very straightforward calculation yields what we wanted. Finally, we want to show that revenue increases when price is decreased if and only if the magnitude of epsilon is bigger than one. So we're showing essentially that if you're supplying the product, um, if, if the elasticity is bigger than one in size, so really less than minus one, then you'd increase your revenue by decreasing price. That's not the same as profit because revenue, uh, obviously profit is going to be revenue minus costs. So again, we may not see exactly where this is going, but let's take the initiative to at least do the obvious starting point. Why don't we write down revenue as a function of price? So obviously, if P is price per unit and Q as a function of P is the quantity of units we sell, the revenue function is nothing other than quantity times price. Now, I want to know when this is increasing. So I'm going to look at the derivative with respect to P. So I have to use the product rule. If the derivative hits P, I just get a 1. So I'm left with a Q of P. And if the derivative hits that guy, I'm going to get dq by dp. Now, I'm happy to see that term because remember, we want to involve elasticity. And elasticity involved that derivative, right? So elasticity was p over q times that derivative. So that means that that derivative is q over p times elasticity. So we can use that. So we get q as a function of p plus p times q over p times elasticity. The p's cancel. And here, that's not a multiple of p. I'm just reminding us that q is a function of price. We might as well suppress the argument now and just call it q again, because now I can pull out a factor of q and I get 1 plus epsilon. So what did we want? We wanted to increase revenue by decreasing the price. Now, this is dr by dp, but when we're talking about a derivative, we're really talking about what happens when we increase the independent variable, when I increase price by a little bit. So if I want to increase revenue by decreasing price, that means that I must have, if you think about it as a sort of graph, just as instantaneously, revenue is increasing when I go backwards, right? So revenue is going up when I decrease the price. So that actually means that we would need that dr by dp should be negative. So even though it's an increase, we're doing it per decrease, so it flips the expected sign. Now, quantity is clearly positive. So that means that I need the other bracket to be negative, And that means that I need this to be less than minus one. But because we've already said elasticity is just going to be negative generally, being a negative number smaller than minus one is the same as having a magnitude bigger than one. So very straightforward product rule differentiation. So much of this question just comes down to being prepared to take the initiative to write down the obvious functions and apply very simple mathematics to them. I hope you found this question interesting. Comment below to let us know what you'd like to see next. And if you want to see more interview questions and advice on interview preparation, do remember to subscribe. If you're interested in more intensive support with your interview preparation, do also remember to visit our website. And thank you very much for watching.